All right, uh, all right, Lizzie, we're ready to start recording. All right. So why don't we uh, call the meeting to order of the hydrogen study task force? Uh, it is Tuesday, October 11th, um, here 2022. We are here in Waterford at the Millstone plant uh, and looking forward to uh, an introduction by Mike and Weezy of the plant here uh, in a second. Uh, thank you, first of all, for hosting us. This is our uh, fourth uh, off-site um, meeting. Uh, thank you, Tony, for hosting us at Fuel Cell Energy last time uh, and the team uh, this time here at uh, Dominion and Millstone. We're looking forward to getting the tour uh, later on uh, this morning. Uh, it's election day. Hopefully everyone got out uh, and voted. Um, let's see. All right. So just want to welcome all the uh, task force members, um, their staff, uh, our technical assistance uh, providers here from Stratagen who are on the line and any members of the general public. Uh, again, just a reminder to mute your mic, uh, state your name if you're talking as well. Um, okay, why don't we go to the next slide there, Jim. Just a quick overview of the agenda uh, for today. Um, so uh, we're going to hear from uh, Mike about uh, this exciting plant here um, in just a second. Uh, we'll then move into the meeting minutes from our last meeting. Uh, we've got some task force logistics uh, that we'll work through. Um, and then we've got a, another fireside chat. Uh, this time we've got uh, Aziz uh, from the Connecticut Roundtable on Climate and Jobs, uh, who's going to give us some insights on um, community benefit agreements and, and labor and workforce development. Um, then we're going to spend a majority of our time today uh, in the working group updates uh, section. So. I really want to have everybody engaged and digging in uh, to the content that's going to be discussed at the, that part of the updates. Uh, then we'll have public comments. And then for those of us who are here, uh, we'll do the tour uh, of the plan. So uh, uh, that's a quick uh, overview of the agenda. Uh, why don't we uh, turn it to uh, our colleagues here at uh, Millstone and Mike, if you want to. Great. Easy. Sure. Thank you. Um, welcome everyone. We really appreciate you being here at Millstone uh, for the task force meeting and tour that follows. There are a few members of my team here. Um, Site Vice President Mike O'Connor, he's the chief executive here at Millstone Power Station. Um, other members of my team, Margo Fagan, John Stoddard, and Lisa Wilson. If any of you need to use the restroom, you will just need to grab um, an escort to make sure you are always in um, line of sight. Uh, more or less, and um, so just make sure you do that if, if you do need to uh, leave this room. Um, we'll do a quick um, intro, try and make up some time, just give you a, a brief uh, overview of Millstone Nuclear Power Station. Uh, Jennifer, I think you're controlling the slides, so you're welcome to advance those if you can. If not, no worries at all. We've got, there we go, um, just a, an aerial view of the station there. Uh, we'll take a walk around later uh, this afternoon, so we look forward to that. If you want to go ahead to the next slide, Jennifer, um, of course, safety comes first here at Millstone Power Station. You got a, a taste of that as you uh, came through the facility and through security uh, this morning. Uh, multiple redundant layers of safety and security. Um, this goes all the way down to use of handrails when you're going up and down stairs. People will remind you if you are not holding on to the stairwell, to the uh, handrails as you go up and down the stairs. Um, our operators, our reactor operators are licensed by the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. They spend 20% of their time in a rigorous training regimen that includes sessions in a full-scale simulator. We have um, a training building, actually right as you pulled onto the access road, you would have passed our training building where we have full full scale simulators of units two and three. They spend time there and in the classroom um, every fifth week they're doing training um, to make sure that they maintain their licenses. Um, we also have um, a robust emergency preparedness program here at Millstone. A number of the employees here at the station are involved in that as well as local, state and federal agencies. Um, and of course we've had exemplary performance here at Millstone. Uh, Jennifer, if you want to jump to the next slide. Just a bit about units two and three. Um, together, they are 2100 megawatts. Unit two is about 900 megawatts. Unit three is about uh, 1200 megawatts. They produce together about 16 to 17 million megawatt hours of carbon free electricity each year. 
just to put that number into perspective, the state of Connecticut consumes about 28 million megawatt hours of energy each year. Uh, Millstone represents the largest carbon-free resource in all of New England, uh, accounts for more than 90% of the carbon-free power that's produced here in the state, and of course its continued operation prevents uh, many tons of carbon dioxide from being released into the atmosphere each year. Uh, Jen, if you want to hop to the next one. Millstone, of course, is tied into the high voltage transmission system here in New England. Uh, that includes over 9,000 miles of high voltage lines crisscrossing the region. That's everything from 115 kb and above. Um, you can see the map there on the right hand side, the red lines. It's hard to see, but the red lines are the 115 kb lines. We have a smattering of 230 kb here in New England. And then the 345 kb transmission system, that's the, really the backbone of the New England transmission system, the interstate highway system. For electricity, uh, we are connected to the 345 kb transmission system. So the power that's produced here at Millstone is stepped up in voltage and put onto the 345 kb system, spread all throughout New England, um, all throughout the eastern interconnection. To be uh, to be clear, uh, we're connected to our neighbors through 13 different transmission lines. Uh, the flow of power over those transmission lines is really based on need and economics. We get quite a bit of power from our neighbors. Um, actually, 16% of the region's energy needs were met by imports of power from neighboring power systems last year. So mostly, most of that is coming actually down from Hydro-Quebec. Um, uh, about 90% uh, of that, I would say, is coming down from Hydro-Quebec. Um, about 350 generators interconnected to this system, Millstones units two and three are, are two of those. In total, the entire system is about 32,000 megawatts of installed generating capacity here in New England. And uh, the flow of power is managed by the region's grid operator, ISO New England, which is headquartered in uh, Holyoke, Massachusetts. Next slide, Jennifer. Carbon-free nuclear power, an important part of the resource mix here in New England. Uh, it's about 23% of the electricity uh, produced here in New England to meet the demand for electricity. 46% um, coming from natural gas fire generation, as I mentioned, the 16 coming from imports of power, 10% from renewables, 6% from hydro, and a very small amount coming from coal and oil these days. Um, those units only run when it's really, really hot out or really, really cold out. Um, so nuclear uh, maintains about 23% of the resource mix here in New England. Of course, um, uh, heavily dependent on natural gas for power generation uh, here in the region. Uh, next slide, Jennifer. We, um, I'm sure you all are familiar with the long-term power purchase agreements that we have with Eversource and uh, United Illuminating. We participated in a competitive procurement process for zero carbon resources back in 2018. Um, and uh, we were selected as one of 12 different uh, projects and project owners um, for long-term power purchase agreements. We are currently selling 9 million megawatt hours of our electricity to Eversource and United Illuminating. That's about 55% of our output. Um, that energy is being sold at $49.99 a megawatt hour or 4.9 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, that's locked in for 10 years, which is a, a, a good low price for carbon-free electricity, uh, especially these days. It's one of the lowest cost carbon free resources procured by the state uh, to date. And then I think I wrap up with the next slide with some key takeaways and I'll close it there. Any questions real quick before we move on? All right. That was a fantastic <laughs> introduction. <laughs> you gave us the whole system in five minutes. All right, thank you. Thank you for that, Louise. Um, okay, let's go ahead and go to uh, the next slide. Um, so we're going to uh, just an appendix okay, slide just in case there were questions. Slides. Yep. All right, All right so uh, we sent along the meeting minutes of the October 11, 2022 uh, meeting. Um, it was the third meeting, so I think in the in one of the bullets there, um, if we could just amend uh, up at the top. But uh, any questions, comments on the meeting minutes from October 11th? Anyone want to move the approval of the meeting minutes of October 11th? So moved. Great. Thank you, Weezy. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. We're, all right. All in favor say aye. 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 Any nays? New extensions. All right, great, thank you. Let's keep on going there, Jen. Um, okay. Um, 
One more. Let's go. Uh, I think we have a few task force logistics to just quickly move through. I think uh, next time we'll just. Um, so, you know, we've, we've got the uh, task force pulled together of the appointees uh, and the ex officios. Uh, we still have two seats uh, open uh, from uh, Senator Kelly, uh, but uh, we're, we're moving along. Let's let's keep going. Next slide. And I think the next slide is the uh, ex officios for the state. Uh, folks, uh, thank you. I see staff members here in person and staff on the line. So thank you for uh, supporting uh, your respective designees. All right, let's go to the next slide. All right, so just a couple of things here and uh, Aaron, feel free to weigh in as well, uh, just in terms of how we're looking at the remaining task force meetings. We, we will still have working group meetings, but these are the remaining task force meetings as we gear up for the submission of the report prior to January 15th of 2023. Uh, so we will regroup um, next month. Uh, thank you, uh, Hi Axiom. Thank you, Sridhar, for uh, hosting us. Uh, we're looking forward to coming up and uh, seeing what's happening there in South Windsor. Uh, we're going to be really digging into the final uh, findings of the working groups and the recommendations of the working groups. Um, we may have one uh, final chat on environmental justice. We're still working through those, uh, but uh, this is where the rubber meets the road. So today we'll start to dig in a little bit and uh, in December we'll start to pull all the pieces together. And then hopefully uh, coming back from the new year, we'll be able to pull all the pieces together and get all those things together for the report submission uh, to the Energy and Technology Committee. Um, so um, Aaron, I'm not sure if there's anything else we want to uh, provide there in terms of that update, but. Uh... No, no, Brian, thank you so much. That's great. I just say, um, you know, I think it's important to us that the task force members get a chance to be a part of the process and and see, you know, the work that's been going on um, as we go through this. So it's it's definitely important to us to be able to share this with you all today and, and to be, um, you know, bringing this information to everyone in December so folks have visibility and have a chance to weigh in as we're getting towards this final report. <laughs> Hey, Aaron, this is Sarah. Um, we lost uh, Wi-Fi in the room, but we're reconnecting. OK, I was going to say you have your your happy room of folks has dropped off of the video, but we'll um, do you want us. Should we keep going or, or do you want us to pause? OK, yeah, yep, you can keep going, Aaron. OK, we'll keep going then. Um, Lily, if you want to take us to the next slide. Um, well, I think so. Uh, that's it for logistics updates. And I think we're on to our fireside chat now. Um, unless um, Brian or Sarah, there's any other final items you wanted to cover on the logistics front. All right. I see you all again. There we go. Welcome back. We're good. There you go. Thanks, Aaron. Welcome back. Go ahead. My goodness. Okay. Um, well, uh, Brian, as I was saying, unless there's any final logistics items, we have up next um, Joe and Aziz to talk a little bit about um, climate and jobs. So, Brian, I don't know if you want to provide any additional introduction on this or if we should turn things over to Joe and Aziz at this point. Yeah, just a, just a real quick comment um, as we're all digging in and thinking ahead about um, hydrogen hubs, hydrogen development. Uh, you know, a continuation around the conversation of the importance of uh, environmental justice, Justice 40, community benefit agreements, really thinking about John Madrid, um, the four, basis three, five, for two. John Madrid, four, three, one of the five, key priorities of the Department of Energy. Um, so just wanted to set that context, but uh, thank you, Asis, for being here with us today, and uh, we'll turn it over to Joe. Yeah, thanks so much, Brian. We're thrilled to be joined by Aziz today um, from the Connecticut Roundtable on Climate and Jobs. Aziz, welcome to our task force. Uh, maybe we'll just start off by having you briefly introduce yourself and then the roundtable. I think you might be muted, uh, muted Aziz. Take two. Okay, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> I'm usually better with technology, especially the unmuting, though some people tell me I should be muted more often. But um, so I'm Aziz Day Khan. I'm the executive director of the Connecticut Roundtable on Climate and Jobs. And um, our mission 
is to find a, a, a path to a just transition from fossil fuels to renewables. And um, I know we'll talk about what a just transition means. I think for everybody in this room, you might have your own definition of it. Um, but as we see it, and I think as the Biden administration and the nation is starting to look at it, um, we need to bring in labor um, into the discussion. Um, if we can show the trades and the labor unions um, a path that gives them jobs, renewable jobs, gives them sustainable jobs in the renewable sector, then we can make more progress in building renewable projects and, and bringing renewable energy to not just this state, but the entire nation. So, and we work with environmental groups, we work with interfaith organizations, social justice organizations to try to build a coalition to reach those goals. And, you know, it, there's no one answer for how to do this. Um, there's a lot of different opinions, and uh, I think our role as the roundtable is to find consensus and to find areas where we agree on. Yeah, thank you. Um, so as we start to dig in, I know you already touched on this a little bit, but I'd love to hear more about how you and your colleagues are approaching the topics of equity, environmental justice, um, mm -hmm. as they relate to workforce development in the energy industry, particularly as we're starting to transition towards clean energy, you know, what are some of the top areas of concern uh, from you and the Connecticut Roundtable? Yeah, um, so <clears throat> we were fortunate in 21 um, uh, to pass a bill that's um, we call not SB 999, but it's an officially called 21 43. And, um, you know, the bill is, I, I love the title of the bill. It's called an act concerning a just transition to climate protection, energy production and community investment. And I think that last part is really important and, and what we'll probably talk about a lot here in the last in the next 30 minutes is what does that really mean? What does community investment mean? And the, the purpose of the act was to, well, let me back up. What we had been finding was uh, there was a project in East Windsor, uh, Gravel Pit Solar, um, that was starting their project and um, they weren't including a project labor agreement, they weren't including prevailing wage. And as my good friend, Joe Toner, the executive director of the Building Trades in Connecticut likes to say, there was no level playing field. Um, they were probably gonna bring out of state people to do the job. And so we we started to discuss with the with the developers on how to stop this, and we didn't get very far, um, not initially. So and what we realized too is, if we were to go after project by project by project, we'd be spinning our wheels and spending more time just chasing projects. So we built, we fashioned a, a bill, um, uh, went to the legislature, and um, we passed it. <laughs> and um, the bill has a um, a prevailing wage component to it. Um, it's based on uh, renewable projects two megawatts or greater. And um, it has a community benefits piece to it and a workforce development uh, piece as well. And so that's that's how we started, you know, being able to look at the path, <laughs> the path forward from fossil fuels to renewables. Yeah, thanks. I think you kind of anticipated my next question on mm -hmm. SB 999-2143. Um, just uh, appreciate the context there and its importance. But, you know, in addition to legislation or other policy actions, you know, can you talk a little bit more about community benefit agreements, you know, what they are and you know, the role they can play in Connecticut's development of green hydrogen? Yeah, so, you know, I, if you've been around the state, um, you see that that some of the more polluting um, factories, the more polluting energy sources, are in marginalized communities. Um, I'll point to Bridgeport um, as, as a prime example of that. And how did it get placed there, right? Um, did they talk to did they talk to the stakeholders in the community? Did they did they have open public meetings? And if they did, how open and public were they? Um, you know, do they have those meetings at nine in the morning when everyone's at work? Um, so community benefits is is a wraparound essentially of trying to find a dialogue to try to find a place where we can all sit down in a room like yours <laughs> and start talking about, you know, what does the community need and do we need to place this, this facility here? And if we do place a facility here, uh, what are the benefits to the community? Um, and are there any benefits? And if they're not, let's find another place. 
but all too often, marginalized communities um, don't have that opportunity. Uh, I come out of New York City and, and one of our biggest complaints in New York City when we were organizing was, you're holding meetings at nine in the morning. You know, and, and, and how do you get how do you get people to those meetings and, and how do you get create a dialogue where you can hear what the community is asking for? So, um, you know, community benefits are great, um, but how do you enforce them is probably one of the bigger pieces. Um, you know, I think we're more uh, in tune to, to listening and to being able to hear what the community wants. And from there try to find language that actually is enforceable. And I think, you know, that's a key issue for us, uh, not just, uh, well, actually it's a key issue for 2143, for SB 999. You know, do we get a developer that comes in and wants to put in, you know, it's two megawatts or greater, do they put two proposals in at one megawatt each? And that's what we have to be careful about. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, uh... You know, this issue is enforce, of enforcement, you know, and or even folks taking advantage of loopholes. And, you know, how do we, what are ways to properly, uh, respectfully call them out on that, right? To help prevent that and, you know, hold folks accountable to the agreements that they have made. Um, uh, with community benefit agreements, you know, maybe you could talk through some of the key provisions uh, they, that they should include, uh, particularly focused on workforce development um, and just transition. Yeah, so workforce development, you know, we what we want to see, and I'll I'll keep going to I keep going to uh, Bridgeport because there's work being done there with offshore wind, and um, we have a carbon-free, healthy school initiative that we're trying to start there as well. But so, I know that community pretty well these days. Um, so you know, in Bridgeport, where we're asking developers who are going to put anything like the offshore wind, Avangrid, we're asking them, and they have made a commitment to uh, use local people to create a local workforce um, and train that workforce for those jobs that are happening in Bridgeport and happening in those projects. Um, what we tend to see is at the margins, I think it is, right? So, you know, you can say you're gonna create 600 jobs um, and you're gonna do the best you can to bring those jobs from the community. How do you do that? And so how you do that is by working and creating workforce development um, uh, pieces and training that, <laughs> that train people and, and, and put those people in those sustainable jobs, put those people in jobs, not just you know, menial work, but work that advances them. You know, and I've, I've heard this too often, and I think it's a, it's a, mis, it's a misnomer. Um, that, you know, the trades don't want to bring in people from the marginalized community. And what I always tell people is, um, I'll take you up to one of their training sites, and you can see for your own eyes who's being trained. Um, the, the building trades in particular, and again, I'll reference Joe Towner, um, they are committed to bringing in people of color, to bring in BIPOC peoples, and just to make sure that those people get the, the, get the advantages that they previously did not have. Um, and apprenticeship programs are key to this. Um, and, you know, I don't want to go too far afield, but one of the issues that we always face is you can train everybody you want. You can have as many apprentices as you could possibly have. I guess the real question can, comes down to how do you get them to the work site? And transportation in Connecticut certainly is an issue, but I don't want to drift too much on that, but it's, it's certainly an issue that we need to address. Yeah, absolutely. And I had transportation highlighted on my notes. So <laughs> you know me that. well, Joe. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, no, it's a key piece. And we had Joe Toner speak to our uh, policy and workforce development working group, too, and talked about, you know, the importance of giving folks to job sites, uh, you know, if they're trained, but you have to actually get them there. So, um, yeah, I think all these are, are so important and critical uh, and work hand in hand with you know, um, provisions on job quality, living wage, um, you know, it's really a whole whole set of things, right? Because if there's gaps, then, um, you know, you're not really achieving what you're going for, particularly during a just transition. So, um, you know, that's, I mentioned gaps, that's kind of my next, next question with so much activity around hydrogen. You know, where do you see some of the biggest gaps in community engagement, uh, particularly related to workforce development, but also, you know, equity, environmental justice, and you know, what additional requirements might be necessary or appropriate? Are there, 
are there areas where Connecticut policy can be furthered to to make the state more competitive, perhaps too? So I I know that's a compound question. So I asked like three or four different things there, but I'll, I'll let you go. <laughs> so I'm new to the to this task force, and I'm new to understanding what uh, what you know hydrogen actually means as an energy source. Uh, I'm I'm grateful to the Green Bank that they're sending us to California to conference to learn about this. But I'm not so certain that it's any different than any other energy source that we're trying to develop, right? And so the question is not so much what, how does the hydrogen fuel, how, how does the task force and how do the developers create these benefits, but how do we push on the developers <laughs> to create the benefits, right? And what do those look like? And I don't think there's a, I would like to hope that there's a blueprint for that, but I'm not so certain that there is a one that fits all, right? Every community is different. And, you know, again, I talk about Bridgeport and, and, and there's New London, um, there's communities throughout Connecticut that are going to be affected and going to have, you know, development, hydrogen development, hopefully in their in their areas and so i think we need to, to have <laughs> it just occurred to me so we talk about community right and how we talk with the community how do we talk with the developers and how do we make sure that before we even start this dialogue that we know what the developer is looking for and have community participation in it have a, a very transparent dialogue and have a very transparent early start to all of this so that the, both the developer and the uh, community don't come in midway. And I think that's really important. Um, you know, what does a just transition mean and what's equity is, is, is going to be all part of each community's decision making process. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up developers too, because I, I wanted to ask about, you know, areas where you see opportunity for you know, the partnerships to, to further advance this and workforce development, sustainable job creation. Um, you know, we mentioned organized labor a little bit, uh, the local government developers. Um, you know, what do you see as some of the biggest opportunities or areas to focus on here or also maybe the gaps too? Yeah, gaps and opportunities might be in the same line, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and, and maybe it's all about stakeholders and identifying what the who the stakeholders are, um, because we, again, every community is different. Every developer has a different plan, um, but we need to look at 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 the stakeholders and who who are the people or who are the communities that are directly involved in the process and uh, how does it affect their community. And that's not easy. I think, you know, um, our, my experience as an organizer is always how do we how do we feed the grassroots, right? How do we make sure that we find as many people and give as many opportunities for uh, people in their communities to be lifted up and to be heard? Um, it's not always easy. And um, you know, not everybody not everybody knows how to participate in that because they haven't been asked <laughs> in the past. So I think that's a big part of this as well. Is you know, um, years years and years ago when I was working in the hazardous waste division. Yes, I did work in the hazardous waste division. Um, I was with waste management for many years, and we were brought into a room. And we were all high powered salespeople. We were brought into a room, and the first thing we were told is uh, we're going to do a class called Listening 101. And I think if you've been if you've been successful, you know what listening 101 is all about, right? And and but but maybe not. And maybe we need to make sure that we remind ourselves that listening is a huge process in this in this piece. And um, to be able to accept everybody's ideas and find a uh, find a way to coalesce around those ideas. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's like. A great theme of this entire task force too. I think uh, you know that's something we should all keep in mind. The, the listening one on one type of things, right? But um, so the, the Biden administration, you know, as we know, they've established some pretty clear uh, policy priorities in addressing equity and environmental justice uh, in order to access federal funding. So I'm curious to hear how how you would define uh, equity, environmental mm -hmm. justice, and you know, how do you think this task force and, you know, maybe the Northeast Regional Hub should be should be approaching equity, EJ, community engagement? Um, yeah. um, the roundtable um, has uh, has been involved in um, what we call JEDI training, justice, equality, uh, diversity, 
inclusion. And um, I'm not always sure I like the Jedi piece name to it, the acronym, but it does have a nice symbol to it, right? And I think justice is really important as part of the equity piece. Um, I think for my, you know, I can only speak for myself because I think we all struggle with trying to find a, 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 a the proper meaning or the proper definition of what equity means, especially in the work that we're doing. Now, I think equity is uh, has a lot to do with equal access to decision making. And um, I know that that's part of how the Biden administration looks at it um, through the lens of J40. Um, and, and the roundtable, through our, our training that we've had over this past year, has really tried to look at everything we do through the lens of, of equity and 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 a just transition. And we, you know, I'll be quite frank with all of you, we're, we struggle with what the real meaning of that is. And I think that's a good thing, actually, because it keeps us moving forward. It keeps us um, being engaged in the process. It keeps us being able to shift if we need to and to be open to what what we're <laughs> what we're listening to, and so I think you know, for us, a just transition is just that: is to be able to make sure that every stakeholder, whether it's a worker, whether it's a developer, whether it's the community, uh, environmental p uh, folks, that we all have a common ground to stand on, and we all recognize that you know we've made mistakes in the past, and we've we've ignored. In, in all too many ways, uh, the equity piece of any work that we do, forget the work that we're just doing in this room. You know, equity means, means at, at least for me, it's, it's a personal uh, way to live and um, to be very clear of how you communicate with people. That's all part of what equity is about. And so back to the partnerships piece a little bit, but in light of what you just said, I think too, if you were advising developers of hydrogen or fuel cell projects uh, in, in your community, um, you know, what would you tell them about the importance of community engagement and, and how that works with uh, local workforce development? Well, I don't want to be repetitious, but I think I just did, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 think, I think we need to be heard. And I think they need to be heard too, right? Um, I think there should be a clear path, uh, a, a clear design, a clear process of where a developer wants to, where the developer wants to go, not just geographically, but in terms of what benefits that they are able to provide. And I get it, you know, um, community benefits means there's an additional, most likely there's an additional cost to the work that they're doing. but. We need to be clear on that, that, that it just can't be, it can't be a 30 minute discussion, <laughs> right? It needs, it, it needs to be a, a deep and, and thorough, well thought out, written, agreed upon a document that, that creates the benefits that, that the community needs and that the developer can absorb. You know, we, we, uh, I lean on the community side, obviously, right? And, and so, but I also recognize the importance of, of how we need to engage with the developer. I'll be, you know, going back to, to the gravel pit project, had the developer been more open to the work that we were doing, we probably never would have even proposed a legislation, right? But the dialogue was shut down immediately. And so I think one of the tasks that we all need to do, everybody in this room and everybody who's on this task force uh, needs to recognize is how do we open up that dialogue? You know, I think clearly, no, not clearly. I think mostly <laughs> the community wants to have that dialogue. If something's coming into their community, they, they want to be a major stakeholder. Um, we have to maybe find a way to make sure that the developer has that dialogue piece as well. And, um, you know, and then that we fashion something, something that's enforceable. And, you know, of course, the uh, one of the objectives of this task force is to develop recommendations. I think you just provided two or three uh, pretty strong ones. Um, but, you know, I think the other piece of this is um, with developing recommendations, you know, what do you see as some important lessons learned um, from either what's happening elsewhere or what's happened in the past? Yeah, lessons learned. Um, well, you know, I think part of one of the lessons learned is how do we I've said it multiple times, but what about enforcement, right? And how do we engage the Department of Economic um, 
what is it, economic development, um, the ECD, how do we get them involved in a, in a meaningful way as well? Um, you know, enforcement means, uh, means that it's probably going to be at a state level. So we've, we've talked about community, we've talked about developers, we, we probably need to talk about the state, right? And how do we create protocols that will allow the state to enforce. Um, you know, one of the great things that happened during the work on 999 was um, Katie Dykes and her involvement and her coming to us um, and letting us know, well, we need this and this and this in the bill so that we can enforce it. <laughs> and, and I think that's key, right? Um, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to get to 2030 and um, enforcement and, and the ability to have the state agencies be heavily, heavily involved in the process is also pretty key here. Um, so I think that's what we would want to do. Uh, I, I'm not sure I answered your question, but I, I, I think that the idea really is to um, build something that works, right? And and I think, again, that's, that's never going to be easy because there's there's so many people who have so many different interests involved. I think it's the, uh, the, the, the mandate perhaps of this task force to make sure that that happens, especially as we develop a new energy source in the state. We have a unique opportunity here. Um, and I think we, we should be real, real careful about how we use that opportunity and be very, um, very have our ears open as much as possible. For sure. I, I know we're kind of coming up on time here, unfortunately, and you know I could talk to you afternoon. I wish we had a little bit longer, but um, you know I did want to give you uh, an opportunity to just share any last thoughts on anything that you know that we haven't had a chance to touch on today. Mm -hmm. uh, so the floor is yours for, for a little bit. Okay. Well, I think I've covered a lot of ground, <laughs> yeah. uh, and um, you know, local participation, uh, economic development. I don't know if we've talked really enough about you know what the stakeholders want for economic development, right? We're in, we're in our marginalized communities who haven't seen that kind of economic development, who've been promised it so many times, but they don't get it delivered. And there are always ways for, um, for agreements to be, you know, worked on the, on the corners, so to speak. And I think that we need to be sure that the corners are tight, <laughs> that the, that actually there are benefits coming to the community and that you know whatever that looks like whatever you know is it i don't even know what it looks like frankly because every community is going to want something different and again it can't be cookie cutter and i think really my takeaway and my, my great desire and and my honor to be on this task force is that we have a, a unique opportunity here to create something that you know might be different and that might actually benefit those communities that have not seen those benefits. And the other piece is, you know, we need to, it, it, we need to train people. We need to make sure that workforce development works for the people that most need it the most. Um, and that means pushing on the trades too, you know? I mean, they're, they're heavily involved in these programs and I've, you know, I've given them a lot of credit in this call and in this talk, but it just doesn't end there, right? It, it, you have to keep pushing on people and making sure that if there's a goal line somewhere, that the goal posts don't get pushed, um, that we actually can meet the, 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 what we're looking for and that we work together to make that happen. And, and that's, you know, my last piece is that, let's work together that, and, and involve everybody that needs to be involved, exclude nobody and listen to what, what what comes to us and find a way to make that happen. Um, you know, community organizers, we love, we love to put people together, <laughs> and at least I do. And, um, you know, building coalitions is never easy. Or let me put it this way, building coalitions can be easy, keeping them together is never easy. So we have to find ways to keep those coalitions together. And um, I'm glad to be a part of that. And I hope all of you who are in this room and who are on this call will, will join us in making this kind of stuff happen. Yeah, and we're so thrilled that you're a part of this conversation and a part of this task force. Uh, so you know, I just wanna thank you again. This has been such a pleasure. Um, and of course, if, if folks have any questions, uh, you can go ahead and answer them in the chat and we'll find a way to get to uh, get those questions to Aziz and um, address them. So 
Uh, thank you again, Aziz. Uh, and with that, I, I'll hand it off to my my colleague at Strategy and Aaron Childs, uh, who's going to discuss some of the. Oh, yep. Good. Yeah. Just just real quickly, Joe Aziz. Thank you for that uh, conversation. Really, really important. I, I just wanted to say I was inarticulate before in trying to set this up a little bit. You know, this is a really important thing that we're adding here in terms of this process. This type of conversation. Um, I was part of the Biden Harris transition, and I can tell you. Uh, being responsible for helping ascertain the Department of Energy, that across all of the, the people involved in that effort, there were four things that the administration said we need to make sure every, every agency is doing, not only the Department of Energy, it was an across government activity. First was making sure we're living up to the uh, zero carbon electric sector by 2035 goal, uh, working towards a zero carbon economy by 2050, justice 40 and just transition. Like, like those four things were Part of our everyday conversation and by having Adrian for our well last time you know Bridgeport was selected as one of the 24 communities lead cities across this country that is the seminal pilot program for community conversations on clean energy pathways in this country so hearing and learning from what Adrian said you know here in Connecticut we have a an environmental uh, uh, Justice communities definitions. Uh, Connecticut General Statute 22A 20A. We have definitions for vulnerable communities uh, in Public Act 2005. So we've got a lot of policy grounding that's consistent with the Justice 40, which is great. But having the conversations, as we learned from Adrian last month, is really important. And then today, what we've heard from Aziz around community benefit agreements and, and building you know, wealth and investment in communities. We have a competitive advantage with Public Act 21-43, as, as Aziz is alluding to. Uh, I was in Tennessee two weeks ago with Secretary Granholm, and she was really excited to be talking about the billions of dollars that the DOE was going to be putting into recycled materials, uh, batteries. Uh, and the one thing she noted was that of the 20 winners, 11 of them had community benefit agreements tied to them. So if we expect to compete and win for federal resources, we really need to be listening to Adrian and Aziz um, and, and having conversations with communities and making sure that as developers, uh, we're working with the citizens in our community. So uh, Aziz, thank you for that. Joe, thank you for the, for the chat. And uh, let's turn it back over to you, Aaron. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, and Lily, if you wouldn't mind bringing our slides back up, I think we're um, going to get back onto some of the, the program here. So um, I think Joe and Aziz really uh, highlighted some pretty important themes there across the board. But but one I think that's really resonating for me as we head into these work group updates um, is just a, a need and desire to bring a lot of folks into the conversation, um, to be doing some listening, to understand different perspectives and understand how we can find some areas of consensus. Um, we've heard a lot of, of really great feedback in our work group process, um, and we, you know we're we're working um, dedicatedly to make sure we're bringing forth that feedback and and everyone's input and um, you know coming to some some areas of common ground. So with that, I'll I'll go ahead and start stepping into the work group update. Um, just for folks uh, who you know haven't been maybe on the full journey with us or who are just getting joining now. Um, we are uh, running this task force with five work groups, policy and workforce development, funding, hydrogen sources, hydrogen infrastructure, and hydrogen uses. Our team here at Stratagen has been collaborating directly with the chairs that you see listed here to provide guidance and direction on the overall um, information that we're bringing forward in these work groups and making sure we're really in tune and in sync with some of the, the on the ground realities in Connecticut. So a big thank you to um, all of our chairs who have been helping in this process. Um, if you'll go ahead and go to the next slide, Lily. Um, these chairs have been, or these, excuse me, these work groups have been meeting since September. We just finished our second round of work group meetings. So we're about halfway through at this point. Um, all of these work groups are, are open to the public, and if there's anyone um, who is interested in these work groups and has not been participating, we, we really encourage you to get involved, as this is where a lot of the meat of the conversation is happening. Um, but given that we're about halfway through, we wanted to provide folks with a little bit of an update on um, some of the work that's been done, done to date, 
the overall direction of this work and sort of how we see this work coming together to be informing our, our final report and final set of findings and recommendations. So that's the general um, objective of today's update. Please feel free to drop any questions in the chat as, as we go along. Um, we can see if we can answer them as we go, or we, we also are planning to have some dedicated time for questions at the end. So uh, this is intended to be interactive. Our goal here is to get some thoughts and, and feedback from folks, share with you, make sure folks feel um, comfortable with, with what we've been doing and, and sort of what, what it means for the task force overall. Okay, uh, next slide, please, Lily. So just as a reminder, um, Special Act 22-8 is really focused on studying hydrogen in, in Connecticut's economy and energy infrastructure. Um, there are seven specific provisions, as you can see in front of you, that we've been looking at to guide our research and development activities. So we are looking at regulations and legislation um, that can guide development of economies of scale, of hydrogen economies of scale. We're looking at workforce initiatives and the potential workforce initiatives that can address some of the questions, um, gaps, opportunities that, that we just talked about with Aziz. Um, we're talking about how we position the state to take advantage of um, federal funding incentives. And for those who are following along with, with that process, there are a lot out there. Um, but to Brian's point, these are competitive processes, and so we want to make sure that Connecticut is really well positioned for these, um, you know, this federal funding. We've been looking specifically at the Brownfield um, Development and Loan Program and some of the funding opportunities that may be available through that program and how those flange up with some of the hydrogen opportunities in front of us. We've been talking about other funding sources. We've been looking at, at some of the funding that's been developed in other states and how that may align with, with what uh, Connecticut might be interested in developing itself. Um, we've been digging into clean hydrogen sources. We've been digging into sources of energy for clean hydrogen, as well as um, looking at topics like what, how can we produce hydrogen from sources like biogas. Um, and last, but most definitely not least, we have been talking about potential end use applications for hydrogen fueled energy. Um, as folks know, a big goal here is, is the opportunity that hydrogen presents to support um, end use energy applications. And so this has definitely been a big area of focus. Brian, please feel free to chime in here. Yeah, so just a couple of things for the task force. So in the special act, there are seven really clear things that the legislature laid out to us. So I think we're all going to want to be really comfortable that what we're delivering to them as of January 15th is addressing those seven things that they've laid out. So, you know, just as an example, provide a review of regulations and legislation. So have we done that? Have we looked at it? And, and in the context of that review, what do we think? What are the gaps in terms of how we can guide the development and achievement of hydrogen economies of scale, right? So. So we all really need to feel comfortable that we're responding to those seven areas specifically that the legislature has set. And then Aaron just noted there um, the biogas. We're also here um, at uh, Millstone uh, here. Uh, nuclear is noted specifically in the statute in terms of sources as well. So as we've been delving into wind and solar, uh, we also need to look at biogas and nuclear because it's specifically uh, addressed uh, within the context of, of the statute. So looking forward to learning a little bit more uh, later on today about Millstone and the potential there. So I think we all just want to be um, sure that, again, what we're delivering January 15th is addressing those seven things uh, to the best of our abilities. OK, Aaron. Thanks, Brian. Um, helpful reminder. Um, and, you know, coming off of what Brian says, you know, on the next slide, we've mapped back some of our key research areas. Um, to the the objectives that we laid out on the previous slide. So we've been um, taking taking you know what was in the direct legislative language and then thinking about, hey, what does this mean in terms of um, specific research areas, analysis areas that we want to be engaging in with our work groups to make sure that we are responsive to the task that has been laid out in front of us. So um, what you see in front of you is some of these key areas um, as well as the work groups that have been leading up those areas. So policy guiding principles have really intended to um, in, ensure that all of the, the policy work that we're developing here, the recommendations are really in sync with what is already happening in state statute and state policy. We've been doing a policy assessment um, that looks at the current state of policy um, and, and helping us to identify opportunities where we could be perhaps proposing policy that might help 
hydrogen development and deployment. We've been looking at the Brownfield Grants and Loan Program, uh, again, understanding the current state of affairs on this program. Um, one of the big pieces I think is coming up next for us is really this toolkit of hydrogen incentives. So we've been um, understanding all of the, a lot of the state uh, um, and federal funding opportunities, and there's quite a bit out there. I've been starting to think about, okay, what exactly does this mean for Connecticut and where does Connecticut wanna be focusing their efforts on this front? Um, we've had a bunch of fun doing some, some analysis on hydrogen production potential and end use potential, and we'll, get, we'll show you some of those, um, some of that work today. Um, we've also been looking at um, some of the infrastructure, the hydrogen infrastructure that we expect will be uh, relevant for a scaled hydrogen economy. Again, we'll be talking a little bit about that today. Um, and then again, last but not least, um, an end use prioritization framework. Um, talking about the, the feasibility of hydrogen end uses and their ability to, to provide and create some, some pretty significant societal benefit for the state and for the communities within the state. So this is the way that we've been um, kind of approaching the, the questions that have been laid out in front of us and the, the objectives of this special act. And so just wanted to orient folks against this sort of high level objective before we start diving into some of the work that's been done by the work groups today. So on the next slide, um, just wanted to give folks a sense of how some of these uh, work groups are coming together. I know we've gotten questions in work groups of folks saying, hey, uh, where is this work going? What happens next? And so wanted to lay out a high level kind of arc that we're seeing here. So the uses, sources, and infrastructure work groups have been doing a ton of research and analysis to um, develop a body of, of, of work, a body of research that we are expecting to help inform and prioritize the work and research that will be continuing to be carried forward in the policy and funding work groups. These work groups are intended to be working in concert to be achieving the broader objectives of the task force. So in terms of where we are today, Uses, sources, and infrastructure have been working with their stakeholders in the work group to develop a high-level framework that allows us to understand which end-use applications may be of highest priority for the state, which ones may be able to create the greatest benefit. Um, these work groups have also been developing some initial cost estimates of hydrogen production, particularly looking at federal incentives and understanding what this means for how hydrogen will be comparing to fossil fuel costs. So really trying to say, hey, what will it cost to produce hydrogen and what does that mean for the relative cost effectiveness of this hydrogen that we're producing? And we're also starting to look at the potential levels of supply and demand to understand the overall volumes of hydrogen that we're going to need in order to, to meet the end use applications that we're laying out. Now, how does this get carried forward? Um, what we're starting to think about is how these findings go from being primarily focused in the uses, sources, infrastructure work group into how the policy and funding work groups are incorporating these findings into the policy analysis, funding scans that they are taking on, and what that means for potential areas that Connecticut may want to focus in order to activate its hydrogen economy. So questions that we're starting to think about is, um, where do we need additional stakeholder engagement and policy actions to enable near-term deployments? I think we heard from Aziz very clearly that there's a lot of conversations that folks want to have. Um, this task force has uh, you know, a specific end date and a specific date for us to be developing this report, but that does not mean that this is um, that these conversations need to be ending at that point. So how are we starting to think about what conversations are priority and teeing those up to happen? Um, questions around uh, where, where there's opportunity for funding to really have an impact on cost effectiveness and cost effective adoption. Where can we really be catalyzing market action? Um, we also want to be thinking about questions about, you know, who are some of the, where are some of the most appropriate venues for action to be taken? Um, I, I think folks are, are very aware that, that you get different levels of conversation and different types of conversation in different venues. And so, again, um, what do we need to be doing? Where do we need to be directing this work to bring folks together and have the conversations that are needed? Um, and, and similarly, um, I know there is a ton of work going on right now thinking about Connecticut's clean energy future, how we get there, what it takes, um, to what extent are some of those existing venues a, a really productive place to be um, bringing hydrogen specifically to the table and having discussion on that versus 
um, where where are there really, we need to create some separate space. These are really big topics. We need to be kind of opening up a, a new room, if you will, um, for these discussions. So this is how we're kind of really approaching some of the work that's been done in use of sources and infrastructure and how we're thinking about carrying that forward into policy and funding. Um, and I want to give folks a sense of this. You are going to get to hear from all of the work group chair, um, our work group leads on the strategy team specifically, although I do encourage chairs to weigh in, um, talking about some of the work that's been done and how we're going to be carrying this forward. So this is, again, just a really high level scan. Um, on the next slide, I did want to, um, you know, spend a, a couple of minutes just talking about um, prioritization of, of opportunities and kind of how we're thinking about the question of prioritization. I know we've heard um, from a lot of folks that the hydrogen economy is very nascent. There's a lot of technologies and and um, tools that are still being developed and still still being figured out. Right? There's a lot of opportunity space, and we know we're at the beginning of it. Um, and there was a real desire not to close off any avenues of interest or, or avenues that may be high potential. And so just wanted to spend some time kind of acknowledging the fact that there's a lot of work happening right now in the hydrogen space. Um, anyone I think who is involved in any of these hub efforts know that there is so much to do and never enough time to do it. And so we want to make sure that um, we're respectful of the fact that we, we know that state and regional efforts are going to have resource and time constraints that will impact how and where they engage. Um, and and the, some of the specific resources around convening specifically um, are all in high demand to be facilitating these conversations. So we want to be helpful and supportive in this process by saying, hey, um, here are some of the areas that we think can really have the greatest impact, can have um, the you know the most create the most benefit, and we we're, we want to make sure that we're not in any way diluting the potential for for meaningful action. So that's really our intent here when we think about prioritization and the approach to prioritization. I do want to be clear that um, prioritization is not a sign when we're looking at this prioritization and some of the stuff we're coming up with here. This is not intending to say that there's a lack of opportunity in any of these spaces or that there's a lack of need. Um, I think anyone who's engaged in planning processes knows these these things will take a while, right? We're not expecting, I would love to be able to tell you that we'll have all of the answers for everything hydrogen related by January 15th and that no more work will be needed. Um, but I think you will all laugh me out of the room if I say that, right? This is a, gonna be a multi-year process and what we're thinking about is really how we get started today um, and where we would recommend folks start today and focus their energy today. So I really just want to orient folks with that lens as it relates to prioritization and how we're thinking about prioritization. And we do also, to be clear, want folks to chime in on this fact, right? Um, we are looking to make sure that our, our prioritization and our findings there are in sync with what the folks in Connecticut need, how everyone is seeing this industry and this economy coming together. So please do um, chime in on these pieces. But with that, um, I am very excited to get out of the way and let you all hear directly from some of the work groups, the work group leads. Um, so Colin, with this, I will turn it over to you to talk a little bit about um, some of the uh, prioritization criteria and use case evaluation frameworks. Thanks, Aaron. Um, yeah, so taking, uh, starting where Aaron left off, um, we, uh, in order to develop our sort of prioritization buckets for end uses of hydrogen, we evaluated different applications of hydrogen against multiple criteria, which are listed here below. There, there's eight that were really identified as being particularly uh, relevant to reference uh, cost competitiveness against alternative decarbonization solutions. Uh, GHG reduction potential within the state of Connecticut, commercial readiness of the technology, um, any additional infrastructure requirements needed to deploy the technology at scale, um, environmental justice concerns, uh, workforce development opportunities, the value of resilience in that particular end use, and uh, the amount of additional safety protocols or regulations that would be needed to deploy a hydrogen in this end use safely. Um, so in addition to considering these different criteria, we also uh, solicited feedback from stakeholders who um, have been working in this field for uh, quite some time. Uh, they provided valuable feedback on you know, air quality emissions, impact on disadvantaged communities, alignment uh, of these hydrogen use and these end uses with state policy and environmental goals, 
Uh, we also heard from a number of uh, leaders in the industry on market development activity uh, being conducted around uh, some of these end uses. And finally, you know, looking deeply into workforce development opportunities uh, that are key for the state. Um, so jumping onto the next slide, I uh, can give you a quick breakdown of uh, how we sort of bucketed these opportunities. So just reiterating first what Aaron said, we sort of reframed the way this framework was um, put together uh, rather than uh, identifying, you know, here's where hydrogen will be used and here's where hydrogen won't be used. We identified which end uses we, for, based on feedback from stakeholders, we felt it was more valuable to identify which end uses um, were uh, warranted uh, a deeper look by other working groups and by the Connecticut legislature itself. So we're really bucketing these end uses according to the priority with which we think that uh, they should be continued to be investigated going forward. Um, and on that, based on that, on the uh, bucket to the far left, we have the highest priority end uses for additional investigation. These are end uses where, based on the underlying economics, we have high confidence that hydrogen will be used, either because uh, hydrogen is already economically competitive in these end uses, or it will most likely be the most competitive option, in some cases, the only economically competitive option uh, for decarbonizing a particular end use. Uh, End uses in this bucket also have the potential to create substantial societal benefits across some of the metrics identified above or in the last slide. Things like greenhouse gas reduction, workforce development through higher deployment of fuel cells. And this is in a large, uh, uh, in many cases, a factor of the scale of the industry industries in this bucket. There, um, there's significant opportunity to hit large scale if hydrogen is adopted um, to a large degree in these end uses and therefore there, uh, we identified them as being a highest priority for additional investigation. Um, these end uses include critical facilities that have a, a requirement for 24 hour backup power, um, aviation, particularly long and medium haul, um, cargo ships uh, that run transoceanic routes, material handling equipment such as uh, warehouse forklifts or port equipment, long haul heavy duty trucks, uh, fuel cells used for uh, peak power generation on the electrical grid and high heat industrial processes. Um, moving on to the next bucket, uh, these are areas that are still a high priority for additional investigation because there's a strong financial case for hydrogen use in these applications. Uh, and there's still an opportunity to create societal benefits, but potentially on a smaller scale, mainly due to the size of the industry. And so these are areas where um, there's potential perhaps for uh, demonstration projects to uh, determine whether technology is mature or economically competitive or can be safely deployed at, um, without uh, negatively impacting surrounding communities. So some of the end uses in this bucket are long distance bus routes, ferries, freight rail, um, fleet vehicles with long uptimes and very specific refueling locations such as police cruisers or ambulances. And finally, hydrogen blending in natural gas pipelines focused on non-core customers like power generation and industrial heat. Finally, in the bucket on the far right, um, we identified other applications where it could be valuable to use hydrogen from a greenhouse gas reduction standpoint and other perspectives. Um, and so these are end uses that can be kept in view uh, by uh, legislatures as the economics of hydrogen versus alternative decarbonization measures develop. They could provide additional opportunities for market development, but the economics of hydrogen versus alternatives are less settled here. And so there is, um, you know, they, they did not move into the uh, higher priority buckets because of that. These include things like proposed and uh, like hydrogen blending for commercial and residential customers, uh, commuter buses, heavy duty trucks with lower daily driving ranges, um, privately owned light duty vehicles, low heat industrial processes, and short haul aviation. Um, I also point out that uh, we, uh, as part of this analysis, uh, conducted technical assessments looking at a wide range of applications within these end uses. And so the uh, ana analysis is refined by understanding that certain uh, applications, such as commuter rail, short range harbor craft, forklifts with shorter uptimes, you know, may uh, um, become, uh, may offer more. Uh, promising economics for electrification, and, and so wouldn't be included in the, the priority applications that are ultimately put forward to um, for further review. So jumping on to the next slide. Well, maybe I should pause first and see if there are any, or we have questions at the end, right, Aaron? If 
if anyone has a particularly burning question right now or um, on the uses, uh, please speak up. But otherwise, I think it may be helpful to save questions for the end. We can have a little bit of a discussion, um, give, give Colin a chance to sort of run through some of the findings here. Thanks, Aaron. Okay. In that case, jumping on to the next slide, um, I want to provide a quick uh, look into some of the analysis we've been developing uh, and the insights it provides on hydrogen's cost competitiveness against the fossil fuels that are the uh, dominant uh, fuel source for most of the end uses that uh, we just discussed. So there's a lot on this slide. I'll direct you first to the graph on the left, which shows the levelized cost of energy uh, from a number of different uh, renewable energy resources in Connecticut uh, going out to 2050. Um, right now, we're just looking at solar, onshore wind, and offshore wind, but other opportunities or other feedstocks uh, can be added in the future. And you'll see a pretty consistent downward trend in the levelized cost of energy with a, a uptick around 2032 and the uh, production tax credit and investment tax credit that were extended in the last uh, federal legislation are phased out. And then on the right, we have um, the levelized cost of hydrogen um, compared to the uh, price points in which it would hydrogen would reach price parity with different fossil fuels. Um, so as uh, the cost of electricity and the cost of electrolyzers drops over time. You see steady reductions in the levelized cost of hydrogen you can produce from these types of resources, um, uh, which you can see in the, the solid bar uh, lines on the graph to the right. Um, I want to point out something about this, this graph that I don't think is immediately clear um, from uh, looking at it. Uh, it looks a little bit like if you installed an uh, electrolyzer in 2030, you could produce really low cost hydrogen from solar for like a couple years, and then the price of hydrogen jumps as the production tax credit phases out. Um, that's actually not the case. What this is saying is that if you installed an electrolyzer in 2030, you could get low cost hydrogen, hydrogen at that, that uh, price point identified in 2030 out uh, for the entire life of the project. The um, uh, IRA locks in the production tax credit uh, for a new project installed before 2032 for a full 10 year period. And so what this means is that, especially around 2030, when um, the cost of electrolyzers have uh, dropped um, or presumably dropped, there is an opportunity to develop projects that have uh, that can produce hydrogen at a, a significantly uh, lower cost um, than in the past and, and necessarily in the future when the production tax credit um, is removed. Um, and this is exciting. I, I, I'll especially point out the um, relative cost of hydrogen in 2030 to the co expected cost of diesel and gasoline. Um, there's a pretty uh, big gap there of, of almost $3. Um, and although these are preliminary results and we'll be refining them over time as we uh, speak to industry stakeholders and, and refine our assumptions and inputs. Um, that's a that's a pretty uh, significant gap um, that uh, will potentially make hydrogen a, a strong competitor in transport applications specifically. Um, I'll point out again at this footnote at the bottom, uh, as this footnote at the bottom spells out, that these uh, LCOH estimates are sort of the the price at the point of production. And so they don't include the additional costs from uh, building pipelines, building fueling infrastructure, tapping into hydrogen storage. Uh, that would certainly add to the cost of hydrogen that the final customer sees at the point of delivery. Um, and these are costs that we'll be investigating as part of the infrastructure working group and providing more uh, insights on um, in the future. Um, but this uh, analysis right here kind of gives you gives a sense of you know the the price gap that we're working with at the moment. Um, um, and but Colin, before we move on, I do just want to note um, biogas and nuclear will be assessed as a part of this process. We are getting there hopefully in the next work group, um, but especially with y'all at Millstone today, I want to make sure that we did flag that that is going to be a part of the process. Absolutely. Thank you, Aaron. So jumping on to the next slide. We can get into a quick discussion of some of that infrastructure that uh, I just referenced um, in the previous slide. Um, this is an area that the infrastructure working group has been focused on, um, primarily at this point identifying the potential locations and availability of different components of the hydrogen uh, infrastructure ecosystem. 
Um, on the left, you can see uh, the location of salt deposits, which are uh, the uh, most uh, commercially and economically competitive form of hydrogen storage at the moment. Um, they don't extend as far as Connecticut, but there are some salt deposits in Western New York and Pennsylvania that could be accessed by a regional hydrogen um, transmission system. Um, similarly, in the bottom left, you see uh, the location of um, the existing transmission or uh, bulk natural gas transmission pipelines across the state of Connecticut, um, which could provide opportunities to um, develop hydrogen infrastructure as well by utilizing existing right of ways uh, that uh, the gas utilities have for these natural gas pipelines. So something to investigate in more detail in the future. Um, on the, the far right, we also have uh, an overview of some of the uh, leakage concerns that are connected to um, you know, any sort of pipeline project. Um, and hydrogen is no exception. A growing body of research shows hydrogen can have an indirect climate warming. Um, and though, as you can see by this um, graph from RMI, the uh, leakage rates for hydrogen are generally lower than natural gas. It still uh, shows that uh, strong regulation is critical to minimize leakage and maximize the kind of benefits that would come from developing this sort of regional hydrogen infrastructure. Um, so a quick overview of some of the uh, topics uh, and issues that the infrastructure working group is currently engaged in. Um, moving on to the next slide, I think we can pass it off to um, the next speaker. Thanks, Colin. Um, and Lily and Joe, I think if the two of you would would step up to the, the virtual microphone and talk a little bit about how um, both of your work groups are, are thinking about some of the findings that Colin has shared and how we think about carrying those forward into, into policy and um, funding activities. Sure, thanks, Erin. And hi, everybody. My name is Lily Backer, and I am helping to manage the funding working group. Um, so to date, as Aaron may have mentioned earlier, the funding working group has been taking stock of the federal funding opportunities that can be applied to clean hydrogen. Um, and we're focusing specifically um, per the statute on the IIJA opportunities at, to start, but we're also assessing opportunities in the IRA, the Buy America, and other relevant federal um, funding sources. And simultaneously, we're seeking to understand the state opportunities, both those that are directly um, about hydrogen and those that can be applied to hydrogen. Um, that can be tapped to further the role of hydrogen in Connecticut's um, environment and economy. Um, with this specific lens on potential sources of funding for Connecticut to utilize as match funding um, for the IIJA, which um, has a match funding requirement for each um, opportunity. So we'll be using this research to make funding recommendations um, both about the hydrogen hubs and beyond. Um, this research specifically has a focus on areas of funding that support the identified end uses um, and infrastructure needs that have come out of the work streams that Colin just described. Um, and then these recommendations formulated from the funding working group will be passed off to the policy work stream to be integrated um, as many of these funding recommendations will have a policy implication. Those will be passed over to Joe, who's managing the policy working group. Yeah, I, I can pick it up here. So, you know, in light of what Lily just mentioned, the policy and workforce development working group, uh, we'll be taking a look at both what comes out of the sources and uses groups, uh, as well as the recommendations from the funding work stream. And, uh, you know, we'll be kind of putting it all together, looking at areas where policy can help support uh, cost effective adoption of clean hydrogen uh, for those highest priority use cases and you know what rules might need to be clarified both to help fund and help facilitate deployment um, and where might policy making processes help help build some consensus around you know these types of no regret uh, kind of investments and you know part of that again is is looking at where best practices from other jurisdictions uh, could be relevant for Connecticut and you know, help provide some guidance. And uh, finally, you know, what are the best or most appropriate venues uh, for pursuing uh, these types of policy actions? So, you know, I, that's where we're currently focused as we continue our work here and as we're moving things along. Um, 
Aaron or Lily, anything else to add here or any additional questions or, or comments from folks? Well, just a quick plug that this work is very much still underway and we would love as many people's participation that would like to. I have fabulous co-chairs that are supporting this effort um, and providing direction, but so much of this funding, um, you all are the experts on. Um, you've been managing these programs or utilizing them over time, um, and we would love your input. So certainly welcome you all to the funding working group party. Um, and if my coaches are on the line and have anything to add, feel free to unmute and share. Hi, this is Carmen with the uh, Department of Economic and Community Development. And as Lily said, you know, it, it is uh, we're, we're in the process of working through all of this. The the work that comes out of the end use is, is really important to help us really understand the gaps and the opportunities that we need to um, identify as well as to articulate in our recommendations. But um, you know, welcome any other input and insight from any other the other members. And uh, thank you, Lily, for your work on this. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Joe and, and Lily. And we do want to hear from the chairs. So if you are our chair or you are here representing a chair, um, uh, get, get ready. We would love to have you step in and, and chime in about this process. Um, I do want to flag, though, before we maybe uh, call call our chairs up to the microphone, um, some of the feedback that, that we've been hearing from stakeholders. Um, you know, to Aziz's point, we have been doing our best to listen um, and want to kind of repeat back some of the things that we have been hearing from folks, in part to make sure that we've been hearing them correctly, um, and in part so that this group as a whole um, gets a sense of some of the, the different perspectives that we're bringing into the room and, and how that feedback is, has been flowing into the work group process. Um, so just a couple of, of thematic areas of feedback. Again, these are, these are summarized because we only had one slide to put these all down on. But um, you know, we're really hearing from folks that that this this hydrogen economy is very much nascent, um, and and it's important for us to be thinking about a really broad portfolio of potential end uses and sources, and be thinking with an open mind about how the hydrogen economy could evolve. Um, we've been hearing from folks about the importance of hydrogen as a part of the decarbonization toolkit, uh, but also hearing that there's uh, are, folks are really wanting to make sure that we invest in the highest value end uses and that we're not in any way slowing down other decarbonization investments as we start moving forward with hydrogen. Um, we've been hearing about the need to really be focusing on hydrogen as that decarbonization solution and real concern about um, potentially continuing to depend on um, fossil fuel sources and the need to be really looking instead at um, you know, minimizing reliance on, on these carbon-based sources. We've been hearing from folks, as these not least of them, that hydrogen investment is a really significant opportunity for, for communities um, and that we need to be focusing on workforce development, environmental impacts to make sure that we're creating benefits across the state. Um, we've also been hearing from folks about the need to be thinking about existing infrastructure and compatibility with existing infrastructure and opportunity to repurpose some of that when we're thinking about end uses. So specific call outs there. Um, we've also been hearing from a, a lot of folks that this is still new, and this is, a, again, a theme that we're hearing, and we don't want to rush into any really big decisions right now without understanding some of the broader ramifications and some of the broader impacts, and that stakeholders still have a lot of questions that they want to be working through in these processes. And we've especially heard some of these pieces around the natural gas pipeline system um, and some of the decisions that are happening there. So just want to put some of these out for folks so that you can um, hear some of the thematic elements that we have heard from everyone. Um, but with that, Brian, Sarah, I don't know if you want to um, start kicking off some of the kind of comments and feedback here, or if there's any chairs who are interested to step up to the microphone and, and provide comment. Yeah, so why don't we just open open the mic to folks. Um, feel free to raise your hand and uh, just uh, give give some comments, thoughts. I have some, but I don't I don't uh, want you you all to engage. I have one comment or question to the policy working group. I don't know if you guys can hear me from the online. 
One thing that I keep hearing, and this has come up several times in the last week, you cannot drive a fuel cell car through Boston tunnels or New York tunnels. I want to make sure that Connecticut does not have any embarrassing policy roadblocks like that by the time we're done with this. If there's anything like that, we need to identify. I know policy working group is, is focusing on how we deploy hydrogen, but is there any other things that we need to be looking at? Like simple blocks, because we haven't thought about this before. I don't know, Aaron, if you have a response for that, but I feel like having heard the, the session from last time in the Sandia presentation on, uh, on the driving through the tunnels in Boston, like to your point where I think you're saying, uh, make sure the permitting and all the all the things are in line, some of the basics so that we don't run into those, those sorts of situations. Yeah, but we talk about heavy duty trucking, right? Because between New York and, and Boston, Connecticut is a very heavy trucking route. If you built for it, but realize that we're not going to be able to drive the trucks because they cannot leave New York or they cannot get into Boston, that would be a big step, right? So Some, this, something like that. This is Julia Dumain, um, Connecticut Pura, from the policy working group. Um, I think that question applies in, to the inverse of the last, or is consistent with the last bullet on that slide, that in the same time that we don't want to rush into any um, strategies or policies, um, you know, encouraging hydrogen, we also don't want to do the opposite that ends up um, implementing any kind of uh, legislation that discourages hydrogen at the same time. So we need to just be really cautious in what we do and flagging things, um, I guess, that could become, you know, uh, obstacles in the future. We don't want to trip over ourselves in the future. Brian, if I can add, um, this is Alex Isaac from Fuel Cell Energy. Um, thinking about the fact that these conversations um, are here focused on Connecticut, but we know that Connecticut is part of a larger, you know, the Northeast Hydrogen Hub conversation. Um, I have been involved in conversations led by NYSERDA, where there is also a separate policy working group happening where they are addressing those very questions that you raise, and they're excellent questions. And what I would like to propose, and maybe somebody already has done this, so I apologize if I'm being repetitive, but is to uh, see if we could reach out to the NYSERDA group as a checks and balances of the work that we are doing here. Again, we don't want to always, you know, reinvent the wheel every time we're starting this discussion. Um, and if our colleagues and others, some of whom are in this room and from our regional neighbors are already and have been involved in this conversation, it would be interesting to see what they've gathered specific to Connecticut make sure it's everything that's appearing on our list and to the extent that it's not it's something we could give consideration to a, a follow-on comment to what alex just said i think concept papers were just um were just filed through the um, hydrogen hub process so it might be good for this group to take a look at the concept paper that was filed for the northeast hub just to just to have situational awareness on on what the focus was on the concept paper. Yeah, it was pretty sterile, right? Because they had to redact so many things. <laughs> right. So it's 80% redacted. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's an interesting point. You know, um, the Green Bank is also a party to that uh, MOU from NYSERDA. And yes, it has been very slim about what we are able to see and talk about, but perhaps the policies that are enabling for for those hub activities would be something that wouldn't be so um, restricted by yes, sir. confidentiality. So. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would I would tend to agree with you, right? Because I think we all saw the draft that came out and we all saw the redaction, right? Um, but I know from working on the policy working group, there was definitely a lot of folks who were giving, you know, uh, statute specific references throughout the New England area. And for each state, they had a list of, okay, this is going to be a roadblock for us. Let's make sure we are engaging with stakeholders in that state. So, you know, they're going to have to pass new legislation to, um, you know, revise, you know, the way this is currently drafted. If we could just get the Connecticut piece of that analysis, again, just to make sure everything that somebody else has flagged is also on our radar. 
Yeah, Lydia, uh, Becca, is that something that we can look to you to um, from Deke to, to connect us into? Yeah, I've, I've, I've had, so Lydia here, so I, I raised my hand, but I'm just jumping in so I can um, answer some of this. Um, so yes, I was going to say, but somebody else, I don't know exactly who, thank you for that, already uh, gave the update that we submitted um, along with the other uh, Northeast states. We have just submitted the uh, concept paper for the hydrogen hub. Uh, this is the first milestone. We still have to submit a, a, a full application in April, early April. So all these conversations um, regarding uh, a, a policy a policy perspective um, and trying. Uh, th this is not going to be made as a, a just a regional policy because each state has has its own. Um, but we are trying now to come up with something that it's uh, a little bit more regional for this hub. So this is an ongoing process um, and this is going to be um, more thought through and discussed now during the full application development. Um, what else has been asked and that I could? Um, oh, and regarding the C CTPs, on it, this is also something that it's uh, being developed, and we cannot really share things that are developed in the hub process due to the uh, MOU that Sarah just mentioned. Uh, but what I can assure is that everything that we have been talking and discussing and learning through all these uh, processes, and especially the the task force, uh, it has informing us a lot on that and it has been incorporating in all all of uh, all of our discussions um so it, it has been really helpful all the work that has been doing has, has been done here and i guess that's it <laughs> others questions comments I'll just I'll just throw one thought out the discussion that was happening in the funding uh, working group. Um, uh, Carmen, uh, feel free to weigh in here. I, I thought it was a really healthy conversation around. OK, what are the priorities of the industry in Connecticut? If we're going to be thinking about policies and funding mechanisms, what are the you know, we, we heard about uses and sources and trying to prioritize and get to well, well, the state can't do everything. So so how does the state think about if there are tax credits, as an example, uh, what areas of priority should the uh, industry be thinking about? So that was kind of put out there in terms of, a, you know, we need to be thinking strategically about, about that question. Uh, the other thing that came up was around um, the existing uh, IIJA, IRA opportunities that are out there, which is, okay, so they're out there. So are our are, are universities, are our companies competing? Are, are they commenting on those documents? Are they competing in those RFPs? Uh, what is it that uh, we're doing now to position Connecticut to compete and win in those RFPs? Uh, so a conversation around, again, in the funding bucket, uh, how are we doing thus far uh, with what's out there? Um, so maybe we'll have a question to, to task force members about you know, folks who are submitting in RFIs and NOVAs and all those sorts of things. How are we doing? But other other comments, thoughts? This is Carmen. I just wanted to just piggyback on what Brian had just said relative to us really taking a competitive, looking at us from a competitive advantage, right? And in not only the industry that's here in Connecticut, but as we compete on the national landscape, you know, putting our best foot forward in regards to the right types of, of investments and, 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 and funding opportunities, right, that we want to participate in and supporting, um, that we, we look at our competitive advantage and trying to really optimize that. Uh, I have a, a general question. Um, whether it's the philosophy of the task force that we have a hard deadline for completing the mandate of the state of Connecticut, or we will, or it's our philosophy that we'll do the best we can. Because if it's a hard deadline, we need to have a budget time for discussion and another budget for per permits. And I, 
I'm just not sure if, if those things have been capped and how much time we can allow. Yeah, so just uh, on this special act, 22-8, um, uh, there are seven specific things that the Committee of Cognizance is, is requesting from this task force that are outlined in the statute. So we have to all be really comfortable uh, by January 15th that we're responding to those things. We talked about them earlier uh, in the conversation. Um, so that presentation of the report to the, to the Energy and Technology Committee uh, would be our findings and recommendations from this process. Where the uh, ENT committee decides to go from there based on that feedback on, on the policy funding, all the other fronts is, you know, up to the, you know, the executive and the legislative branch to figure out how to take that context uh, in, in a policy framework. Thank you. Hi, this is Sridhar Kanuri from Hiaxium. Uh, to the comment that uh, Uger made earlier about uh, cars not being able to go into tunnels in New York and Boston, as we develop the policy framework for Connecticut, are we engaging the local fire chiefs from a perspective of uh, uh, training and readiness to handle these kinds of uh, transportation related things that are going through in Connecticut? Uh, I was very surprised in a, in a recent interview where we met with the Glastonbury fire chief um, and the kids were asking him questions about lithium ion batteries and, and he mentioned that they're woefully underprepared and apparently uh, fire truck plus <laughs> the water tanker that comes behind it are not even able to douse the fire of a single car uh, that catches on fire. So, as we go through these policy and trainings, do we engage them and make sure uh, that we are ready uh, to handle the challenges that come out uh, of safety for hydrogen as we create the policy? Just a just a quick response on that. I, I you know coming from the example of solar PV in its early policy days of getting deployed in Connecticut, as the market started to pick up, these sorts of issues started to rise. Uh, as things would happen. Um, and um, those policies then began to get legislated for things like training local fire, uh, you know, about how to deal with uh, solar in a, uh, you know, in a home situation. But, you know, policy picked them up later. I think in the context of uh, the Green Bank and our work with the utilities implementing the energy storage solutions program on battery storage, to your point, Sridhar, those sorts of questions are going to start to come up, which is, as the market starts to pull these technologies through because of incentives and, and the benefits that these technologies provide, we're going to need to start working on the permitting and the, the fire training and the you know X, Y, and Z. Those things come up. So the faster we start to do them and build them in earlier, the better. Um, so then maybe in the context of this conversation, it's a question for Colin. You know, you have safety as one of the criteria in the framework. Did it take into account fire safety as part of that? Um, yeah, so the uh, safety criteria was really focused on what additional safety regulations would need to be developed and what amount of additional safety regulations would need to be developed in comparison to an existing kind of uh, end use or, or you know fuel use in a particular sector. Um, and so something like fire safety uh, for fuel cell vehicles is definitely something that would be considered you know, in this safety criteria, you know, there's obviously a need to develop uh, additional safety protocols for fuel cell vehicles um, as they become uh, more market ready. Um, and the question on that criteria is really, you know, not are more safety uh, regulations needed, but how much more onerous is it to develop safety regulations for hydrogen fuel cells versus, say, diesel trucks? And obviously the um, safety regulations for diesel trucks are already established because they're already on the market. Um, and so the question we're asking there is, um, you know, is there an order of magnitude more uh, like kind of safety concerns or safety procedures required to do the same thing for fuel cell vehicles? Or is it just they haven't been developed yet because 
that um, there isn't a need because the market hasn't developed. And and just to chime in on this, you know, the, the research that was was developed in the um, for for the um, end use assessment, right, is looking at a scan of the current state. I think what Sridhar is raising is, hey, we need to be talking to uh, fire departments and other emergency response organizations to make sure that they know. Um, appropriate safety protocols, right? And to me, this is something that uh, is is an appropriate part of our findings and recommendations in terms of how we might think of the state carrying this work forward and carrying forward feedback that we've received about how to make sure that these technologies are being deployed safely um, and that the state is prepared for more wide-scale deployment, right? So I know we've done historically work with the National Fire Protection Association um, because these are concerns on on lithium ion energy storage and, and so sort of the safety concerns there because these are going to be national concerns and there's going to be a lot of folks who are working to figure this out. Um, but Connecticut definitely, you know, has opportunity to, to think about this question and, and how it wants to be engaging with communities, right? I also feel like I'm, I'm channeling Barbara uh, Fernandez here a little bit in the context of Connecticut also has another competitive advantage, which is we are a, a hub for the insurance industry. So what can the insurance industry in Connecticut do for the hydrogen industry as a whole in thinking about some of these sorts of challenges? So so that may be that may be something that we're not going to tackle in full force now, but maybe a recommendation for consideration for the energy and technology. Great, great points. And I would just say, if I could close a loop on that, um, you know, knowing that, um, you know, pass, um, light duty vehicles, uh, hydrogen vehicles are being, um, you know, bought and driven around the state of California. I know that there are at least, you know, 15 or maybe there's more than that fueling stations existing out there. Um, again, going back to the thought process of not having to reinvent the wheel, um, we could look potentially to the uh, regulations that are in place or the safety standards that are being implemented in California as a starting point for the conversation here. And we had to go through all that with the fire marshal. We built a fueling station on our property, you know, so we had to teach them pretty much everything. But I think that that's some years ago and as that's as the technology has matured, I think that codes and standards are slowly catching up. The, the good thing with this is that you can look ahead and, and, and project this out, right? Because these hubs aren't going to be anything that gets deployed for you know, whatever, five, six, seven, eight years. So as long as you kind of project out on the timeline when these policies have to be put in place, at least you can get in front of them. It's not, and it goes back to one of the bullets that Aaron had on there that said, um, how do we make do with what we have today? And then how do we plan for what's kind of tomorrow? So, you know, so I think we have the opportunity in front of us to use the existing infrastructure. We have the opportunity to kind of leverage some of the experiences in the California fuel and infrastructure that they have in place, but also be able to take that and to say, okay, here's the gaps. And this is what we have to have in place when these things go live in four or five or six years, I think. So we have a little bit of time. You can't park cars in your garage either. Fuel cell vehicles in your garage either. Insurance companies won't insure it if you park them. So we've had that happen. It's more than just tunnels. <laughs> it's, it's more than just a single tunnel we have in the Merritt Parkway. <laughs> so, Brian and Sarah, I know we're starting to run into our public comment period. Um, we have one more slide to put in front of folks, but but we're getting some really, really great thoughts and feedback here. Um, and I don't want to, to shut this down if there's other folks who, um, you know, want to chime into this discussion. Okay, I'm not hearing anyone jump in. Um, but I do just want to say, you know, we're, we're hearing folks. I think the, the voices that we're getting um, today and in this room, I think, are um, emblematic of what we've been hearing from work group in terms of folks engaging and, and raising questions. Um, so thank you, everyone. You are, are helping to make sure that we're casting a really broad and, and robust net and, and um, picking up all these pieces. Um, the, the engagement we've been getting has been absolutely critical to the findings that you've seen today and the way that we're approaching this process. Um, and we, we know that folks, some folks have different issue, um, perspectives on some of these topics, but we have really been um, energized by the, the productive and, and thoughtful dialogue that we've been seeing in, in work groups. 
Um, and, you know, given this really, really wonderful feedback we've been getting, um, you know, we, it's, it's become clear that an important part of this task force process is capturing some of this feedback and making sure that this gets recorded, that these questions, concerns, um, thoughts, excitements are all getting um, incorporated into the way that the state thinks about um, rolling out some of these findings. And so one of the things that we're excited to do is um, launch a request for written comment so that folks have a chance to put down some of this thought and feedback in written format. I know these uh, meetings, despite the fact that they're two hours, somehow always feel very short and we run through the time very quickly. Um, so, so we will be, um, we are planning to put out that request for, for written comment um, with those comments planned to be due December 9th. Um, and Lily, if you'll take us to the next slide. Um, you know, these, the, we're going to be putting out a, a couple of questions, but obviously we will welcome any feedback that folks want to provide. Um, questions are intended to cover some of the, the big topics we've been hearing about here, including um, defining clean hydrogen, uh, stakeholder engagement and equity, hydrogen supply, hydrogen infrastructure, funding and policy activities. So um, we really appreciate everyone's engagement so far. It's been it's been really great, and and we want to make sure that we're not losing any of these pieces. So Sarah and Brian, I don't know if you want to add add in on chime in on this. Yeah, I mean the only thing that we'll say is um, I, I think that this came up in some of the working groups that I sat in uh, last month. You know, the intention of the final submittal to the Energy and Technology Committee is to provide some high level recommendations, but we know that not all of the task force members or all of the participants in the working group are going to agree with um, some of the top line recommendations that we might present. And so this is really an opportunity to ensure that we are presenting our legislators with the diversity of opinions um, that we have on these topics. So really encourage you to consider um, submitting application, submitting answers to these written questions. We work with the strategy and team to make sure that they are streamlined. Um, so hopefully it will be uh, comprehensive, but not uh, an enormous lift. <laughs> we realize a lot of you are probably very RFI, RFP deployed, yeah. you know, so all, all those sorts of things out. So uh, we'll try to keep it uh, simple. Thanks, Aaron. All right, so uh, Aaron, anything else? No, that's that's it. Unless um, anyone else wants to kind of chime in on some of the, the work group pieces, I think, Brian, we'll, we'll turn it back over to you. All right. Um, all right, so um, let's see if, if there's anybody out there who has any uh, public comment. Feel free to raise your hand uh, or uh, jump in. Um, Aaron will track, track you and... All right, let's go ahead and pull up just the final slides. If, uh, we'll leave it open for public comment in a second, but let me just kind of wrap up with uh, where we are. Um, so just want to thank, continue to thank everybody for uh, their involvement in this process, um, the task force, the working groups, uh, your direct feedback. It's all really, really helpful. Uh, take a look uh, at the website. The website's also um, a resource for everybody. Um, the team has done a great job just keeping everything timely and posted. Uh, and, and we've also been recently translating documents into Spanish as well. Um, um, so take a look uh, at the website. It's a really useful resource uh, for everyone. Let's go to the next, the next slide. Uh, we're going to continue um our journey around the state uh our next uh meeting is going to be uh, at high axiom in south windsor um so we're looking forward to uh, uh continuing to dive in and learn learn more about uh, fuel cells um that will take place on december 13th um from uh, 10 to noon and then we will have the tour uh, of high axiom uh, after that um so uh I think this will be the fifth location uh, that we'll be at and uh, looking forward to uh, uh, seeing uh, uh, folks there. Any uh, final public comments before we uh, adjourn the meeting? Well, yeah, this is John Feinstein. I just wanted to agree that some showstoppers have been identified that are external to Connecticut, and those should probably be mentioned in the final report. Great. Thank, thank you for that, Jonathan. So we'll uh, 
be sure to get you that, you know, give us that feedback directly um, in the comments. Um, uh, I'm eager uh, to learn on those showstoppers, but thank you. Anybody well, else? like the, the, the safety codes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, why don't uh, we uh, adjourn the meeting of the task force? Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a great time on the tour. We will. Thanks, all. Take care. <laughs>